Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm chief scientist and co-founder at Topsy Labs. We have uh, the world's largest publicly available index of tweets. And uh, we've built a system that indexes and analyzes all these tweets. And we have lots of people using this for uh, all kinds of different use cases. So the one I'm going to talk about is based on a white paper that we did, which is available from our website, um, on how Twitter is being used during disasters and for disaster relief. And how analyzing all the tweets that you get, the tens of millions of tweets that are out there, you can figure out a lot of things about patterns of communication. So just a little background to start with about, uh, about Topsy. So as I said, it's got the world's biggest Twitter index and social metrics. Um, we do a lot of things for brands, news, entertainment, finance, and government. So there are lots of different use cases. And the way we look at it is that there's been a big shift in how information is disseminated around the world. Instead of our primary source of information being uh, publication, we can now access publicly shared public conversations or publicly available public conversations. The problem is that all the public conversations are so um, are noisy. And uh, when you do not have an editor or a curator playing that role of publishing, that intermediary, intermediating role, then you've, you're drowned in a flood of information. And the only way to get, make sense of that information is to use technical tools. And that's essentially what we do. Um, we don't know anything about disasters or any of these other subject areas. So what we do is just take all the noise, get the signal out of it, and the signal is based on what users are looking for. Um, so just, uh, I'm not going to go into the technology, but I just wanted to tell you something about the scale of the system. So we've got, uh, you know, 2,400 servers slurping all this stuff up, and as soon as a tweet comes out, it gets into our index, and there are 200 billion tweets in there, and they're all indexed, and you can slice and dice the data in all kinds of different ways. So, um, with that as a background, how does, how does this get used, or how can this get used in disaster relief? And we had, um, we looked at how uh, tweets were being used during Hurricane Sandy. And uh, part of the, this goes back to what I was saying, that we're always using different tools of communication. And previously, most ordinary people are using tools of communication that are very informal. They're conversations, they're not necessarily intended to be private conversations, but they were not historically easy to access. So you would know what people are saying on the streets of New York in a storm because a journalist happens to be there and listens to what people are saying and then writes about it and then you buy a copy of the newspaper and it's already well after that actually happened. Um, the internet didn't really change that so much because instead of having to read the New York Times in print, you read it online and it still requires a journalist to listen to what people are saying. And uh, what social media has done is that people are saying these things in a format that allows anyone to access what they're saying. So these are public conversations which are now no longer you know, blowing in the wind. They're actually available on the internet. And if you can use index technology or search engines like Topsy, then you can access this data and make sense of it, or at least try to. So uh, you know, what happens after a natural disaster is that people start talking to each other and people start talking about what's going on. Yeah, I know, I'm just going to. So people start talking about what's going on. They try to find uh, other people who, you know, find loved ones to see whether everything is okay. And in doing that, when they're doing this in public, they're actually producing a lot of information about what is going on. So they're like, I'm lost in this street somewhere, and uh, it's really, uh, you know, the entire road is flooded. They're not necessarily <laughs> intending to tell the whole world about it, but that is a side effect of them telling, of them publishing this information. Kind of like the information that Ushahidi slurps in. Um, it becomes useful because uh, there might not necessarily be an intent to try to help the aid workers, but People are talking about things, this is going public, and if you're able to access it, you can make sense of what's going on. Also, uh, a lot of people, because of the way modern communication networks work, phone networks, cell phone networks often go down while 
some internet services might still be available. Or things like SMS might be available when uh, the phone network is not available. And that's where Twitter comes in because Twitter has an SMS interface. So people use Twitter a lot during disasters, which is quite interesting. And it's, it's done in a lot of um, all kinds of parts of the world. Uh, but we'll be looking at examples from, from Sandy. And um, what happens in this case of uh, Twitter responses is that people are communicating and they're broadcasting information. And um, they often use it to talk to organizations or to talk to each other. And organizations can use it to talk back to people. It's kind of a generalized broadcast that you're directing towards people, but at the same time, anyone can search and figure out what's going on by looking at, um, on Twitter, you have hashtags where people are labeling what they're talking about, and you can search for everything mentioning those hashtags, and thereby get to get a sense of what's going on around the topic. So um, there are basically uh, three different ways that uh, people organize how they are communicating after a disaster. There is peer-to-peer -peer communication where you're trying to talk to your friends or you're trying to talk to other people in general or trying to reach out to other people in the same situation. There's peer-to-organization communication where you are, you are actually taking a picture of something, sorry, you're taking a picture of something and you want to send it to a newspaper or a media organization or uh, uh, an emergency aid organization or something like that. So you have no way of contacting them, but you're kind of broadcasting a message that has a particular organization as a target audience. So that's peer to organization. And then there's the other way around, organization to peer, where you are, say, FEMA, and you want to tell people that this is the emergency number that you can call if you're in this location, um, or you should avoid this bridge then you can do that, where again, you're broadcasting a message, and you, of course, use radio and TV and other methods, but you also use social media because that reaches a lot of people, and people can rebroadcast those messages. So I'll show you some examples of this. Uh, one of the things that is very interesting about peer-to-peer -peer communications is that people are often taking pictures of something on the ground, or they're specifying a location in text. They're not you know, they're not labeling their communication with geographical information from a cell phone necessarily, but they might be saying, giving a particular address or something like that. And we've actually built a system that infers location very accurately based on these public posts. So only about 1% of all the public posts on Twitter have actual location information based on people saying, yes, I want to share my location when they send a tweet out. But we take all that data and billions and billions of these tweets and uh, have a system that learns and looks for features. For example, it might figure out that if you say Forth and Brannan, then you're very likely in San Francisco. And uh, that means that when you have positional indications in a message, you're saying there's a flood on Forth and Brannan, which hopefully there won't be in the near future. But when you say that, then it's possible for someone to figure out that, okay, that seems to be happening in San Francisco and to infer a location. Um, there might be images, and images often have location information in them, so you can look at the image and you know that, okay, that image is coming from there. You get an actual time when it was taken. You know it was taken by a particular type of, you know, a mobile phone or something like that, so you can tell, okay, this is not a professional image from a journalist. This is by someone who happened to be there. So here's an example. So I think something in the translation from Mac to PC uh, broke the fonts. But here's an example of hashtag Sandy. And hashtag Sandy was used during a lot of people. So there's, that's another thing. There's no structure in these conversations. They're not, um, it's not a form that people are filling out where they say, OK, this is what I'm talking about. This is where it's happening. People are just tweeting out messages. And they use hashtags as a way to freeform organize what they're saying. So you need to be able to freeform access what they're saying and retrieve what they're saying as well. So this is an example. This is from Pierce Morgan, but it was actually from him as a person tweeting out an image that he saw out of his window because he works in a building which had a great view of the collapsing train, uh, the collapsing crane, so he took a picture. And uh, as you can see over here, this 
has a specific location that can be inferred. So you know where this is. There's a photo of what's happening and that photo also has a location on it. But he's not really talking to anybody in particular. It's kind of peer to peer. He's just communicating out there. It's a broadcast message. Here's another example. This is uh, uh, during uh, Hurricane Isaac and it's, uh, you know, it's an image where you can see flooding going on. Again, it mentions a location and it has an image and it's being broadcast. So again, this is very useful information and it actually gives you an instant view of what is happening, where, at what time. Then you also have peer to organization, as I talked about, where users are trying to send messages to organizations. And uh, these can be of many different types because uh, users might be trying to provide information or they might be trying to ask for help or they might be trying to provide, you know, direct organizations to go somewhere. Um, so there are lots of different ways this can be done. And uh, they also are trying to get, a lot of this is often sent to news organizations where people are trying to get more attention for a particular message because they think it is important. So here's an example. Um, it's uh, Hurricane Isaac and it's addressed to the Miami Herald. So you have hashtag Isaac, which is what people were using for the hurricane, talking about the damage near the airport and uh, in Haiti, right? And it's being addressed to the Miami Herald. This is how uh, a number of uh, publications actually started using Twitter and they were asking their readers to tweet out to them. Uh, big organizations like the BBC do that all the time, but local, more local publications like the Miami Herald were doing that and they were saying, you know, if you have images of interest, just tweet them to at Miami Herald. Of course, they're doing this as a way of uh, getting access to news that their journalists can't access necessarily, but it works both ways. It does get that news out uh, more rapidly than it would otherwise, and it gets that news out to a much broader audience. And here it's interesting because on the one hand, there is a role for the editor and the curator here because the Miami Herald is going to get all these pictures and then their editors are going to decide which ones to use and which ones to talk about and whether some things are going to go out on the newswire or whether they're going to wait for next week's uh, roundup of all the news that happened. So they will decide what is important for further broadcast. But at the same time, the message is also publicly available to everybody. So if you're looking at what's going on with Hurricane Isaac, then you get to see this immediately, even if you're not a reader of the Miami Herald. So it serves a dual purpose. It's a shout out to an organization rather than a phone call to an organization. So it's not quite the same thing as you know, calling up the Miami Herald or, uh, and sending them an image directly because it gets a, bub a public um, hearing as well as going to the organization for rebroadcast. Then you also have organization to peer communication where organizations can post information directly for the benefit of users on the ground. And uh, you know, these can spread valuable advice such as phone numbers, shelter locations and so on. And also call for public relief efforts and to ask people for help. Um, and uh, so I have a couple of examples of that here. Um, so here's an example from FEMA. This was again about Sandy, where uh, FEMA actually used Twitter a lot for this and they tweeted out many different things. Um, so in this case, they are actually providing instructions to find open shelters. So uh, they're trying to get you to actually use text messaging, but they can't text everybody the text message instructions, so they use Twitter to broadcast out to people, and then you can consult them using text messages to figure out where you should go. Uh, there were many examples of people using this service, sending texts to FEMA, finding out where a shelter was, and then tweeting that out again. So they were tweeting out, people were acting as, you know, FEMA text message to Twitter interfaces so that the information from the FEMA databases was then rebroadcast out on Twitter for a general audience. So then you would search with your zip code on Twitter 
um, with Sandy as the hashtag and you would find tweets that tell you where the shelter is in your location. Um, so it's a good way of spreading and rebroadcasting in an emergency situation without organized channels of broadcasting. The other example is, of course, uh, uh, the American Red Cross, where they're not providing information, they're actually asking for help. They're asking for public help and relief efforts. Uh, so they made a lot of tweets, whether it was tweets asking for donations or tweets telling people what to donate or how to donate or where to donate, or providing information about where you can go and make these donations and what is actually useful. So this was also very, uh, are very powerful because doing it at the right time means a lot of people are thinking about this and they're going to retweet this message. Presumably, uh, some portion of them are going to actually go and donate blood, but it does direct people's attention um, and benefits the organization. So these are three ways that we found that Twitter is being used, or social media is being used during emergencies. And the fact that there is this informal structure that is attached to it through hashtags or other terms or through providing location information allows uh, people who are interested, whether they're doing analysis like we were doing or like you know, different emergency response agencies are doing, it's for analysis or it's simply as one of the participants, as someone who happens to be stuck in the hurricane but, um, and wants to know where to go, or as one of the emergency response organizations, you can actually use social media to find what messages are going on, what messages are rela related to you, and uh, use it either for peer-to-peer -peer communication, use it to address organizations for rebroadcasting a message, or talking to those organizations, but with a public voice, or communicate out as an organization. and. Uh, we're seeing this happening increasingly. Just, you know, like Ushahidi became big in Haiti, but then it has spread all over the place. Twitter has been spreading very widely, in, increasingly in disaster situations. And these are not necessarily natural disasters. You know, there are also things like the London riots or protests in the Arab Spring. Um, social media is being used to talk about what is going on in these three different forms of communication and organize people and organize crowds of people together. So I think we have questions afterwards. So um, um, thanks very much. And we'll talk about this later. Okay. Thank you.